Thank you, sir. Okay, so uh, up next, I believe we're going to have a uh, report from Brendan on uh, some recent uh, Russian uh, war crime activity, I guess is the best way to put it. Uh, so I think I'll turn it over to you, Brendan. Hi, thank you. Um, yeah, um, some unfortunate updates. Um, I just came off of an, a, an appearance earlier in the week um, on Letters to Ukraine discussing the Kherson situation. But uh, today I'm not here to talk about Kherson so much as to talk about sort of like the wider uh, scope and bring some stories to the data. Um, I think one thing that happens is when we are talking about hundreds of people being casualties, we start to lose um, sight of the humanity of the individuals that are affected by these. Um, so I wanted to share uh, some stories um, from from sort of a project that I'm working on. It's it's very time consuming and it requires a lot of sort of checking and rechecking um, information before I post. But I do these threads now on X um, or Twitter um, where I, I'm collecting daily uh, casualty threads, essentially. Um, to to inform people sort of, of where these war crimes are taking place, how they're taking place, and to bring a, maybe a little more of a human element to to what might just appear as like a statistic in a graph on one of my other articles. So I wanted to kind of get away from just the data centric thing and bring it into more uh, story centric, human centric. Um, so to start, um, and I'm then, p picking these for no other reason. Oh, one so, question quick. Be before yeah. we go. Uh, yeah, yeah. Do you also put all these stories on Andrew's map? Yeah, absolutely. All of these are on Andrew's map. Um, all, all of the sources that I've used here are, are straight from Andrew's map, or it's stuff that um, if it's not a channel that Andrew and I are both following and sending to the map, um, I might s like source it from some of my friends that uh, live like, for example, in Sumi. Um, this source was given to me by by a friend that lives in Sumi as a reliable source. It's a pretty reputable organization. So I'll take that. I'll put it into the bot, and then we'll map it. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's basically like a, a, a result of the work you're doing from the map, uh, and you're going into depth more in certain stories, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Where where the information's available, I will provide the depth. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to put it into context that you're doing this work uh, anyways, and you're but but uh, it's a massive amount of uh, information that you probably don't even have the time to write a thread about. But yeah, uh, thank you very much for doing this. I'm sorry to interrupt you. I just wanted to ask that question. No, no, I think it's I think it's good. Uh, people definitely need to understand the the context of it and how I get the information and and um, where they can actually find it themselves too. Uh, I think that's that's a really important point is everyone can find these stories um, on Andrew's map. You go to the 22nd and you go to Sumi and you will find this. Um, so to to start with the first the first story here, this is from the 22nd, um, very recent. Um, so within the week, we saw the use and we've seen the use of these drones throughout the conflict, right? The the use of the uh, Garan 2 uh, variant of the Shahed 136 Iranian drones, the Kamikaze drones, and Sumi has been going through some really horrific um, aerial bombardment, as it is with with uh, glide bombs um, in the last several months, but specifically within the last couple of weeks. But um, just in the last week, however, there's been uh, a real uptick in Garan 2 sort of swarms. Um, there's been lots of videos that have been that have sort of gone viral of uh, the Shahed or Garan 2s flying through uh, Cherkasi or Poltava or Sumi. Um, my friend on the ground uh, was staying with her cousin who lives three doors down from where this happened in Sumi. And she said that every morning starts with with a stream of Shaheds, essentially. Um, and that's nothing that she had ever experienced in her life because she was actually working in the United States when the war broke out. And she's gone back to visit only a few times. But this um, new intensity that Sumi's experiencing. It's something completely new for her. And, and this horror that the people are, are enduring here is, is pretty, is pretty, um, horrific. Um, I, I know I just said horror is horrific, but it, I'm at a loss of words to describe sort of what happens here when we have, um, entire families being killed 
in drone strikes, like a similar situation like this happened in Lviv um, about a month ago. So in, in Sumi, a 50 year old mother, a 14 year old daughter and a 62 year old sister-in-law were all killed um, after a Shahed drone um, crashed into their home, exploded and, and set um, what was left of the home sort of ablaze and absolutely destroyed and, and damaged the neighborhood largely, but destroyed the homes nearby as well. Um, and, um, in, in that attack, there was, um, two, two family members that survived, um, the father of, of the, of the young girl and, and husband of the woman who died and brother of the other woman who died, he managed to survive, um, but with severe injuries, but, um, in, in a really sort of heart wrenching detail of the story and Cordon media reported this, that, uh, he sort of was pulled from the rubble, emerged from the rubble, um, sort of screaming for his for his daughter and for his wife. Um, and you can see in some of the photos as well, um, the the horror of the neighbors who are watching this um, emerging from their homes early in the morning, waking up to um, their their na- next door neighbor's home being completely destroyed and their entire family, uh, the Kushnirov family being killed. Um, and, and one sort of other, other detail about one of the survivors, I mentioned there were two, um, the second survivor was the family dog and the family dog was very important to the, to the family as, as Anya, um, the, the young girl was, was, a canine trainer, um, and, and did, uh, competitive, uh, canine sports with Yuma, her, her golden retriever, um, Yuma survived, but is, is, is now um, seeking treatment with a veterinarian. Um, so it's, it's just absolutely tragic. These, these kinds of stories. Um, I'm, I'm really at a loss of words as to how to, how to describe it. Um, another story, um, out of Sumi that we can take a look at, um, happened a little bit further to the North outside of the city of Sumi itself. Um, that was in, uh, Yastrubshina. Uh, Yastrubshina is in Esmanska Hermada, which it's it, it, to give people sort of a, a geographic context. It's this little nook that exists in sort of the northern half of Sumy Oblast. And that's really where Esman is. It's right on the Russian border um, with Kursk. And that area has seen a huge uptick as well since the Kursk offensive began. And Russian glide bombing across the Oblast has really just become um, a daily experience for these people. Um, you can go back through Andrew's map and see the, uh, specific amounts of, of airstrikes and drone strikes and artillery strikes, um, that the Sumi, uh, admil- military administration has, has made public. Um, so you can really see the bombardment that these people live under. Um, uh, but, uh, another, another tragic story from Sumi Oblast was when a, um, airstrike, a, a, a fab, um, 250 hit, uh, their home and, and killed a, a couple. Um, the couple, fortunately their two children and their, the grandmother were able to, were, were survivors of this, um, this terror on their neighborhood that lasted for, uh, several months. Um, they were evacuated two weeks prior because there was an uptick in the shelling and, and the, uh, the airstrikes. So, Part of the family did manage to make it out, but unfortunately, the couple that stayed behind to look after their home and to to ensure the the protection of their property they were they were killed um, by terrorist Russian bombing. Uh, they completely destroyed their home. So a, a young couple, thirty eight and thirty five years old, with two young children. It's really it's really tragic that those children are now orphans and have um, because only because of Russia and because of nothing else. Um, they, they no longer have parents and, and a woman no longer has, has a child. Um, so that, that story, um, was, was also a a couple that, that my friend in Sumi, um, knew as well. So her, her life has been personally affected by this in ways that she really can't imagine where, it, it wasn't the case so much that, that people that she sort of knew, very personally were being killed in these kinds of strikes, but 
with the way that Russia has conducted their, um, is conducting and has conducted their uh, glide bomb attacks, we can see that the, the toll on the civilian population is, is pretty extensive. Um, and moving uh, not, not to the north, but uh, a little bit further um, back to the west, um, sort of in between uh, Belarus and Russia, um, there was an attack at the beginning of October that was particularly hor uh, horrific, I think. Um, and I didn't really see it covered very much in the media. Um, but my, my Ukrainian language teacher, she's from Cherniev Oblast. And in Cherniev, on the 3rd of October, there was uh, an unspeakable... Um, unspeakably horrific, disgusting attack on, on children, um, but also on a gas truck. Um, my, my teacher told me that her, her, her friend from university is from, uh, Snovska Hermada and said that essentially more, more victims died from the fire resulting from the attack than, than anything else. Um, it was, it was a kamikaze drone attack on a fuel delivery truck that then exploded and and destroyed uh, part of a neighborhood and killed the uh, the two crew members and a six year old girl um, in in the blast and four other civilians were injured as well as uh, kids um, four and thirteen so just some absolutely disgusting horrific um, I I don't know these these kinds of events make make my blood boil. Um, and I'm not really sure how else to describe it. Um, and then to bring things, um, home to more of what we've talked about here or what I've done research in personally, um, to bring it back to Herson, um, we saw at the very beginning of the month, um, a really, um, insidious attack upon the civilian population of Kherson in a way that we actually hadn't seen before in that the central market of Kherson was targeted with artillery fire. And that's not something that we've seen necessarily um, in the past. Uh, when we're talking about Kherson and what gets hit, typically it's infrastructure facilities, going for power, going for, for, uh, homes of civilians with, with drones and things like that. But the central market had actually been relatively free of, of this terror to some extent, right? You do have your odd drone attack, but this was a case of conventional artillery, um, that was hitting, um, the, the central market of Harrison and had, uh, killed, um, six civilians, um, at, in all after one civilian passed away at the, at the hospital. So, so in total in Harrison and central market shelling, we saw uh, six civilians killed. They were, they were mostly vendors and people waiting for the bus stop. So kind of consistent with the pattern of targeting of mass transportation, targeting of bus stops that we've seen from Russia through Harrison. Um, we also see it with conventional artillery, right? It's not just the drones that are doing this. It's uh, we need to remember that, the group that's operating in Harrison, they're spotters for artillery. So you'll find that the, uh, the war criminals are, are not just the drone pilots, but it's also the uh, units that they're supporting, the artillery units that are, that are making life in Harrison uh, a, a daily hell for these people. Yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, it's uh, absolutely horrible stuff. Um, we can talk about like uh, how this stuff can be prevented uh, for countless hours, but um, I think more of, of this kind of reporting uh, would maybe uh, light up more people's mind uh, to understand that the need for for Ukraine to bolster its air, air defenses and also uh, long-range uh, strike capabilities, uh, it, it's really there is a strong need and the, there is a strong uh, uh, obligation for us to uh, to help Ukraine um, defend itself against this stuff. Um, I know um, 
Vasil is going to join us in a couple of minutes uh, from Dnipro, so we gonna have to wait a little bit until he joins. But um, I don't know if any one of the uh, other people in the panel has any thoughts about what Brendan does um, and what just, what it what he just reported on and is reporting on every day. Uh, thank you so much, Brendan, for doing this. By the way. Yeah, absolutely, no problem. If yeah, if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to I'm happy to answer some. I mean, I could also share some statistics from other research I'm doing as well, if if need be. Yeah, the footage you see, by the way, is just a couple of videos from recent uh, events in Herson. Um, the 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 stock footage from um, or the the footage of the actual. Uh, reporting of this uh the stuff that just happened in this on where at the market is not possible to show so um uh, yeah it's too graphic that kind of speaks for itself yeah absolutely it's it's pretty horrific the footage from there Zelensky himself um shared that footage um and some and some stills from it as well as alexander prokudin um because they they understand um the necessity and the uh, of of showing the reality i think i think it also comes from some kind of desperation in a way because how how many times can you tell people that this is happening and have them not believe you um which is the reaction i get sometimes from people that i tell about these things yeah um i i, I can tell about uh, a recent uh, event where i went to an, uh, an event uh, here in oslo um where a very prominent correspondent uh jour a journalist um uh, who spent the last two years just came back from from moscow as the, the state broadcaster correspondent um typically those journalists have you know history of uh studying russian russian studies or russian language studies so you'd expect some sort of um uh other mentality towards Russia than we have, but um, um, it, she, of course, has more knowledge about what happened in Russia and all the bad stuff that the government is doing internally. Um, but she surprised me on her reporting on, on Ukraine as well. Um, but uh, I asked a question at the end of the event uh, about uh, some of the stuff that you're reporting on in Kherson and other places where the drones uh, are attacking civilians and uh, also some of the war crimes uh, related to uh, POWs being executed. And I asked if she had uh, any explanation culturally to why Russians accept this, uh, uh, because we are led to believe Russia is an inform informed, cultured country, modern, blah, blah, blah. Um, but still, they seem to have this culture for death, which we don't really, um, we, we, we cannot really recognize it in the West, right? And uh, the, the room was filled with people who are interested in Russia, so you can imagine the reactions I got. And uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> people were shaking their heads, uh, but she gave a pretty good response uh, uh, on that. Uh, how all this indoctrination of people has happened over uh, decades, um, and and how the culture is 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 different from, than from the West. And it's kind of uh, depressing, but uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I I actually don't have anything um, to say regarding what you're talking about um, or have any questions just want to say it's super important that um, you are keeping track of these things and um, I'm very glad for that when you look at the biggest news media they just seem to pick up on the on these stories and um, yeah but it, it just seems to me that the whole topic was completely neglect, uh, neglected um, in the last months and, and years by now and um, yeah so I'm super happy and, and grateful that you're actually keeping uh track of things by thank the way you, before you. before we go to vasil uh I, I want to ask do you have since you've been reporting on this stuff um 
Do you have did you make up a theory for why Western media doesn't want to take in uh, you know handle these stories? It seems like they're either scared or worried about talking too much about uh, the, the continuous war crimes that are happening in in Ukraine. Yeah, um, honestly, I don't have a theory. It's honestly inexplicable to me um, as to as to why they don't. I mean, I mean, we could get into you can go do, down so many so many avenues in terms of following money and trying to figure out if there's motive in there within ownership of media. Um, but I mean, outside of outside of actually doing like financial research and looking into to cre creating potential motive within there as to why they're not reporting it, I. I can't honestly, I can't honestly think why they wouldn't. Um, I, I, I see w war crimes being covered extensively, but um, some more than others is is is, is I, I just is just theory. what it's saying. I, I think the problem is scale, right? I think it's the same problem with the war. Like, I think that they're part of the reason, like a lot of the public and at least the U.S. today could be like, is there still a war in Ukraine going on? It's that the media seems to have a lot of trouble capturing the scale of what's going on and the volume of information. So I think when we saw the first few strikes on hospitals and things like that, um, we did see pretty wide scale reporting, but now it's a situation where essentially the media is overwhelmed by it. And what instead, of, I think our response has been, okay, well, let's try to like map it. Let's try to aggregate all the data. Let's try to look at the data in ways where we can present it where it um, makes sense to people and it's under the scale is sort of comprehensible in some, some human way. And, you know, we obviously it's not possible to comprehend the scale of suffering or, or uh, warfare going on here. But, uh, you know, we do our best with our infographics and our videos and such. Um, but I think the, the I don't know, mainstream media, I don't know what else to call it or, or legacy media. You know, there's lots of words for it it doesn't seem like they're capable of handling the level of information that's coming in or treating it in such a way that they can explain it. And I think that, you know, it just comes down to maybe resource media resources are a lot lighter on the ground than they used to be. Right. So I don't know, that's kind of my theory about it, but I think we should probably, uh, I, unless you guys have any reaction to that, we could probably move on. <laughs> I agree. Yeah. I'm good to move on. <laughs> 